My name is Amy CQ. My website is hugish.com and I help solopreneurs like myself play big while staying small. Uh, I offer branding, website design, and consulting services to solo people. So with that said, I want to take like a quick poll today. Ooh, that's dark, but hopefully you can see it. Is that, you know, how many people here would classify themselves like a, a freelancer? Maybe you work for other agencies and things like that. How many people would say I'm a solo opener, meaning you de direct deal with clients directly? Okay, so some a little bit half and half there, and then small biz, maybe you're like a partnership or like three people, small team, virtual or static. Okay, yeah, I got a couple. Well, awesome because this is I'm talking to you for this presentation. So sorry guys if you're like in a big agency and things like that. The concepts still apply. But um, I'm really gearing this talk towards people who don't have a team of people creating content and blogging, and that's their full-time job. For us solo people in small shop, we actually have you know that thing called client work to finish, and then actually have to think about you know marketing our own business and getting out there with content. So, uh, just some topics that we'll kind of be going over today is a, a little bit about writing itself and how that can kind of be scary if you're not used to it, putting yourself out there. How to talk to your audience, not at them. How to find ideas and topics to write about, which is a biggie I found for people. And since this is WordCamp, you know, using categories and tags the right way. And setting up an editorial calendar just to kind of help you on your way. So I know you're probably here because you, you kind of know that you should be blogging, but you're not sure how to get started or things like that. Or some people I, I find come to me and be like, yeah, but I'm not a blogger. That's not my job. I offer services or, or products even or things like that. Why should I care about blogging? But it's, you know, we're overlooking a very important and useful way to kind of get ourselves out there. And I'm sure we've all heard the term content marketing. Um, but I never actually looked up the definition. So thanks to Wikipedia. It's any marketing that involves the creation and sharing of media and publishing content in order to acquire and retain customers. Ooh, popping, and we'll do that. Um, so the, the two words that I've italicized that I thought were important is like the acquiring and retaining of customers. And for solo businesses, that's what makes us run. And, and obviously, it's kind of up to us to do both of those functions as well as the client uh, work and stuff. So, so while there's many, many benefits to blogging, you know, you get better at writing, you get better at communicating your ideas, you get your name out there, all that kind of fun stuff. You get to speak at places. The two main reasons to blog, the acquiring and retaining, can really help your business side move. So when you think about acquiring new clients, they're basically kind of broken down into the three stages. So it's the thinking about it stage, the researching options stage, and making the decision stage. And this is in your client's perspective. So if you want to put yourself in their shoes thinking like, okay, you're going to buy a new TV or new sneakers. These are like the phases you're going to go through. So in the thinking about it stage, you may be like searching on Google, just kind of doing preliminary searches. Do I even need this thing? Uh, should I buy it now? Should I get it later? All those kinds of things. And I said it's something like related to your business. I just want to keep that idea in your mind. It's maybe not specifically the offer, but somehow related to what you do. The researching options phase is when you start kind of asking for referrals, maybe you start asking your friends, well, what TV should I buy? You know, what have you bought? Um, maybe you start to notice things that other people share on social. So, oh, this guy that I know, I think is pretty smart, shared this article about this TV. I should maybe think about that and research that a little bit more. And the making the decision phase is now you've like decided Yes, I need this thing. I've kind of researched my options. Now I'm ready to make a decision. So you start to get into the finer questions and details about that product or service. 
And on the retaining end, so this is kind of after now you have that client and they've worked with you, blogging can help you retain those clients by basically being helpful, being educational and interesting. Um, being helpful, you can continue to bring value to past clients by after they've worked with you, by providing that kind of content that they're interested in that could help them. It'll keep them coming back to your website or to you. Educational, you can educate your audience on new ideas and trends and techniques that you become like a trusted resource for them. When they see that new thing out there and they go, I don't know, I wonder what Amy would say about that. And they would, could go to my site. Interesting, which sometimes gets overlooked, but is still very important that we want to have clients coming back um, for more posts and things and content that you write that they actually want to read and, and are looking forward to reading. So again, it's kind of like this is the way to kind of keep those past clients interested in you and your business. So a little about writing. I'm not a copywriter per se, but um, I know some of the trials and tribulations and struggles as a solo person getting started with writing. And while we know we should be writing, it's always, well, why haven't you started yet? And it's, writing is hard. It's not as easy as it's like, oh, I'm just going to throw up a post and don't listen to copywriters when they tell you it should only take you like a half an hour to write a blog post because it never takes me a half an hour. It's way longer than that because that's not my primary function as a business. And it's a little scary to kind of step out and put your expertise out there and said, yes, I know about this and you should care. So because we're all kind of a little afraid that what if no one cares what I have to say? Or what if it's already been said? Or they can just Google that and find the answer. But really people, if they're a past client or even interested in you, they want to hear it from your perspective. What do you have to say about it? What's your flavor on this? Or what's your take on that? Um, so they're, they really want to know your perspective. So it's, it's easy to say that it's already been done, but they really they want to hear it. Because if we get sidetracked by the writing is too hard, or no one cares, we're never going to start. So you're never going to take that first step into creating content for your business and putting yourself out there. And if you never start, you're never going to get anywhere. That's the truth. Some things, again, to kind of remember about writing is that no one expects you to write a novel. Like we're, if that's not your gig, writing, no one expects you to write like Stephen King. It's okay if it's a little rough around the edges at first. It does get easier the more and more you do it. Um, we're on the web, so you know if you made a mistake, you can go back and fix it. Like, Yay! Coming from the print world where it, it's already printed and there's 10,000 copies floating around there with all your typos, that's, that's hard to deal with. Um, so again, it's kind of knowing you can go back and edit it. Gra if grammar and spelling are not your thing, which they're not mine at all, um, you can hire a proofreader. Or if English isn't your first language, you know, hire a proofreader or find a really good friend that's really good at grammar and spelling and, you know, bribe them to dinner or something. And the one aspect that I find sometimes gets overlooked with writing is that it also should be true to your brand. So if your brand is a super laid back surf shop, I do not expect to read a blog post that sounds like a Yale dissertation on your website. It's a mis mismatch of branding. So it's, it's also taking that into consideration as well. Like what's your writing voice, how's, that sign, how's it sound, and how is that aligned with your brand? And this is a, <laughs> just a little side note kind of thing that I've found with a lot of clients is that I love WordPress, but stop writing the initial drafts in WordPress itself. I know it has that nice distraction for your writing. I can't tell you how many times I hear clients come back to me like, I tried blogging and every time I try to write some posts, I lost it. Or my computer crashed and I, it never saved. And 
who knows what's really going on back there, but they have issues. So use whatever is convenient to you. If it's Microsoft Word, write your drafts in there. If it's Evernote, use that. If it's Google Docs, great. You know, just somewhere so you can have a kind of a running list. And myself, I use Evernote because I can kind of um, group all my blog posts under the categories that I know they're going to be in. So I have a quick reference when I go back and be like, okay, I wrote a lot under that category. Or I want to reference something that I wrote before. I just found it's easier for me to get back and forth. Audience. So now that we're kind of like, you know, pumped up to write, we're like, okay, I think I can do this. I can get started. I might not be great at first. I might be a little rough or I might need a little help, but okay, it's time. We want to make sure that we're still, we're talking to our audience and not at them. Uh, and there's distinctly two kind of big issues that I see with people creating content out there. And I think their intentions are well and good from the beginning, but they've kind of taken a, a sidetrack along the way and they get a little bit out of whack. And it kind of leaves them why I hear back from clients, why isn't anybody reading my stuff? Or I don't get any comments and nobody shares it and I don't even think the people are going to the site. I don't see anybody reading it or hitting those pages. The first big thing is, most of the time, is because they forget that it's, it's not about you, it's about them. So, uh, are so dark there, but I love this. It's like, I love inside jokes. I'd love to be a part of one someday. And that's how your audience feels if all they're reading is like how awesome your life is or how awesome like all your clients are or like did this fancy thing. And while personal stories are great and they're very powerful at telling the story of your brand and your business and you, you have to always remember that they're reading it to get some kind of value for themselves. We're a little selfish in that way, right? We're asking a lot of them. We're asking for their time and attention, which are very valuable, especially when you're working for yourself, that, you know, we, we want to make sure we're not navel-gazing and just being like, this is all about me and what I'm doing. It's about them. So use those personal stories to maybe make an analogy to something that would help them in their business or to highlight maybe a problem that they might have had and how you overcame it and how you can help them too. So it's always, again, kind of going back to helping them out. This is a little exercise that I like. I do myself. And actually, earlier this year, I think I nixed the majority of all my blog posts when I redid my website because they weren't passing these exercises that I was doing, was go to your latest blog post or the new one that you're going to write to that initial draft, count how many I's and we's you use. So depending on if you use I or we in your copy. And find ways how you can flip that around. How can you say you instead of I? So how do you make it more about them and less about you? And while, you know, some blog posts might have an I or two in here at the beginning, maybe to set the stage or set the story, we just want to make sure again that we're going back to them and really coming at the posts from their perspective, getting into their issues and problems and solutions. The second issue I see sometimes happening out there is that it's also not about your peers. Now there's one caveat to this because again, it kind of goes back to audience. It depends who your audience is. So if, for example, if you're a developer and your clients are other developers, maybe you're educating them, you're, you're um, selling courses or things like that, then this might be okay. But in most of the times, if your client is not doing the exact same thing in the same industry as you, it's, we have to be very careful not to overuse jargon, get too heavily technical in the technical fields, um, and get too heavy into those real detailed situations of things that we would geek out over, but our clients don't really care that much, right? They're worried about their problem at hand. So say, for instance, uh, they hate their visual branding. They just, it's old, it's outdated, the colors are horrible, horrible. They probably don't want to read a whole blog post that I would write about color theory and, and you know, has it in, in, in books and scientific research on you know, colors. Probably don't care to that level. Maybe they care at a 
different level of how do you pick and what colors mean and this is why designers do these kinds of things and why colors work together and some don't. Um, I use design because the design industry is notorious for doing this. We're talking to our peers all the time. We forget that we're trying to market ourselves to our clients, not each other. Again, unless those are your clients. So another exercise is kind of ask yourself this question of, does it bring value to my clients? Like, if I'm talking about something that they could walk away with and learn something and use, then sure. If it's like something they'll, they'll never touch and that's why they're hiring you anyway, then maybe it's a little too specific or too industry. Will they learn something that they can use right now? And does this belong in an industry magazine instead? Which is fine. If you have a post inside of you that's like, I totally want to geek out over color or type or something, some technical thing that, awesome. There are plenty of blogs out there that are for industry insiders that you can submit articles to or even use it off your website. So a site like medium.com, you know, maybe that's where you can kind of go to kind of show your expertise if you're trying to. Uh, write a post that's a little bit more technical or something like that. But again, if it's not aimed at your client, the people that are paying you money that you want to come to your website, don't put it there. Post topics. So this is another big one. And it's like, I, I can't, so now we're saying like, okay, I can't write about like the nitty gritty stuff of my trade, what am I left to talk about? If I talk about design or WordPress or my website too much that I'm gonna run out of things to say after a while. And it's a real problem to kind of, for, for many solo people or people that are starting out to blog to be like, I, I can't see past like promoting my services. So I found that finding topics, is, it's all about listening. So what, the one thing that could help you find most topics to write about is to listen. Listen to your clients. Listen online. Um, so for instance, what questions are you finding yourself answering over and over again to clients? That could be a blog post. And then guess what? The next client that asks you that same question you don't have to write that long email or have that 20 minute phone call. You can say, you know what, I wrote a post about that. Send them a link. That will save you time in the end. Um, can you expand on any of the, the questions like in your FAQ, if they're a general overview, is there any one that maybe you can kind of dissect a little bit further that can help some clients out? What are the problems and concerns and worries that your potential or current clients have in regards to what you offer. Like, if you're doing calls with them before they sign on with you, what are some of those typical objections that they have? Is it pricing? Is it is this a normal price to pay? Is it features? Is it what do I need? Is it you're the right person? All these kinds of topics can be addressed in blog posts. How to pick the right web designer. That could be a post that you can write. Um, things like going on Twitter, going on Quora and Facebook and LinkedIn groups and listening to what people are asking about that could be your potential clients. Um, you know, Twitter and, and, and is great for searching for specific <coughs> words. Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, it'll take a little bit of time, but if you find a good one, you can know, if you have 15 minutes to spare, it's a great way to just kind of go in and be like, okay, what are people asking about and where can I help them? And then thinking about topics that aren't, well, I shouldn't say directly related, but more like tangentially related to your business. So this kind of applies to especially people that have products, that are selling products. And like how much can I actually talk about this one product? Well maybe how it's, you talk about how people use the product or how they've, have they used it in a different way you didn't expect and you can write about that. Um, some really good places to look at are um, for products, especially is like retail brands, like big retailers. You know, you can only talk so much about a t-shirt or a clothing line 
but they can have you know, user-generated content of like, show us where you've wore this, or even how that, their uh, brand style maybe um, relates to interior design or something. So again, it's just kind of opening your mind up to say, what else can I talk about that people want to know that could help my potential client? Because your, your clients are not only just interested, they only just don't buy something from you. They're going to the malls, they're buying on, online, they're getting services, they're buying courses, they're doing all this other stuff. They're going on vacations. Like, try to think bigger picture. And of course, now that your head is filled with post ideas, hopefully, how do you organize them? Uh, and this is where the categories and tags come into play uh, on the WordPress platform. Many times, unfortunately, I have clients that come to me, whether they've been, they've been creating content for years or they're just started, and they have everything under uncategorized. Every post. And it's, it's kind of crazy. And well, I don't want to deal with that. I just, I don't want, they come to, I don't want to deal with categories. Why, categories, why can't they just be all one? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if someone goes to that post and go, you know what, I'm, this is a cool topic. I, I, want, I wonder if she wrote any more about this. They have quick access to click on that category and find every single blog post that you wrote under that topic. We want to make it easy for them to, one, find other information that we wrote because we spent all that time doing it. Why not make it easy for them to go find the rest of it? And uh, you're kind of, you're keeping them on your site a lot longer if they're finding more relevant information. So the worst plan is really having no plan. Um, this can be done at the beginning, like I said, but if you already have a site that's established, you know, going back and looking at the categories and tags and having a plan from the beginning or moving forward uh, can help you organize these posts and even in your editorial calendars, which we'll look at next, on how to kind of vary and make sure you're hitting all these different topics and stuff. So. I'm going to use a little analogy myself with paper to kind of go with my presentation today. The difference between categories and tags. And, you know, as on the development side, you know, we might use these in very specific ways to pull a specific content out. We might have specific, you know, tags. Okay, if just tag everything that you want for this, then it'll show up over here, that kind of stuff. But, you know, how to, how, getting your mind just wrapped around the idea of it that the categories are the wider, bigger, broader topics of all your posts. We don't want them to be too specific because then you kind of have, you're left with a dead category, a category that can maybe only have one post under it. So for our instance, like if I had a category that was yellow textured paper, I'm gonna have one, maybe two, and then that's it. That's not helping, right? That's not giving them a broader idea of what we can talk about. So we want to keep them a little broader. In our, this example, we have the cardstock, letter, and legal. Okay, well, there could be multiple different paper versions under that category for this analogy. The tags is where we can get really more specific and really talk about the characteristics of that post. And that, that may cross over into many different categories. So for our instance here, like if we had yellow and it's yellow and textured, that's a specific characteristic, or ruled in three-hole punch, in yellow and ruled. So we could see where the crossover happens with the tags. So if someone was looking at, like, I don't care about cardstock because that's not going to go through my Xerox machine. You know, I only need letter-sized paper. Well, they're going to click on that category, and they don't care what color it is. But if someone's like, yellow is my favorite color ever on the planet, and I want to be surrounded by yellow, they can click on yellow tag and they don't care if it's cardstock, letter, letter, legal size, they just want that characteristic. So it, it sounds, in theory, it's very simple. Oh, okay, that's how it works. Now when you go to apply it to your own content, that's right, it gets a little confusing, but I promise with a little work and looking at it and stepping back and saying, is this category too specific? Am I giving myself enough leeway here um, to write multiple posts under it? And can this tag be helpful to people to find related characteristics in other posts? 
If you're still really confused, actually, real world examples help. Go to a library, look how they categorize things. You know, or if you've gone through the experience of doing like e-commerce on your site, or go to like an e-commerce, how are they categorizing things? It's shirts, pants, suits, and then under that, it could be long sleeve, short sleeve, red, yellow, blue. Those are characteristics. So again, it's try to find some real world examples to kind of get your mind wrapped around that idea. So now that we have a plan and ideas for topics, and we know who we're talking to, we kind of need to execute it. That's where most of us get stuck. We're like, oh, okay, great, I have this plan. Oh, now I gotta actually do some work. And the one thing that'll help is having this kind of editorial calendar written out for you. And blogging seems like a lot of work, and probably because it is. I mean, I get it. We have client work to do. Like, that's this, like, again, blogging is not our main source of income here. And the thought of having to sit down and write isn't really appealing. But having a plan in this calendar kind of to, to remind you and set the stage as soon as you have that time, if it's just, I have an hour here, an hour there, or if blocking out a specific amount of time, say Monday mornings, I'm going to write. And so you're not wasting your time sitting there with a blank screen going, OK, I, can, I have an hour to write. What the heck am I going to write about? Instead, you have this calendar that says, oh, today or this week or this month, I need to write about these topics. And it's going to be about this long and post it here. So you can kind of start right out of the gate and not sitting and looking at a blank screen. So what do I put on the calendar? Things like, how many times a day, a week, a month, do you want to post? And this is kind of going to be up to you. And uh, you know, I have some clients that are super like pumped and they're on a blog every day. I'm like, OK, great. That's a lot of writing. Are you willing to spend the seven hours or whatever each week writing and doing all this stuff? No, I don't want to spend that much time. So OK, well, maybe not every day is good for you. You know, picking a reasonable time frame. How many words for each post? Now, obviously, Google doesn't tell us exactly, but the word on the street is like between 2,000 and 3,000 words a month it likes on a site to, to keep it indexable content, that is, so words and things, not video with no transcription, um, to keep it kind of active in its crawling states. So it's going to say, oh, OK, she's actively putting new web or content on her site that I can crawl. So I'm going to keep going back to it versus me like never posting in six months. And then it's going to look over and be like, yeah, I'm not wasting my time or resources crawling that because it's not changed. So we want to be continually writing. So Google's like on it right away and can index it. Uh, which buying stage of the potential of, of the potential client is the post written for? Oh, I do have questions. I, if you can write it down. We'll have some time at the end, and I'll go back to it. Um, so remember those other buying stages of the clients. We want to make sure we're writing posts to all the different stages so that we're not writing posts maybe for just those making the decisions right at the end. Maybe we want to write some posts that are a little bit about people or for people that are new to the idea of hiring somebody like us, that kind of introductory thing, or like the how do I hire a web designer kind of a post. Um, Another thing is, what category will this post be under? Again, it's just to kind of plan out so you don't have a gazillion in one category, and you're like, oh, I forgot about all these other ones over here that I plan to do. Um, and what day and time will it be posted? This is when there's a ton of articles out there. If you Google it, it's just, uh, when's the perfect time to post, or to send it out in a newsletter, or social stuff. And social stuff's a little bit easier to look at, but really, there's no right answer. It comes down to your audience. If your audience works second shift, then you know maybe the best time to post is like 1 a.m. when they're sitting on the couch eating cereal. You know, it really depends on your audience and their habits. Maybe it's maybe they have a nine to five job, and you're working with people who are trying to get out of the nine to five. Well, maybe at their lunch break is when they have time to to read something, and that would be the best time. So it's a little bit of asking. You can ask your clients. Um, you can use your Google Analytics and see what time people are coming to your site and trying to uh, find what's, again, what's best for your client. 
even going as far, you can go even farther than this and say, okay, well, what are my um, social media headlines going to be, or what hashtags am I going to use to plan everything out if you're a super planner. Um, so again, once you have that time to sit down and write, that you're not worrying about that stuff, you have an idea of where you want to go, you can just start writing. And it doesn't have to be super complicated. It could just be a simple spreadsheet. And you write in there and you decide, okay, I'm going to blog once a week. And at 2 p.m., they're going to get posted. How many words do I want to write that time? Category, what buying stage? And maybe even like call to action, like what would I want this person to do? Do I just want them to subscribe? Like kind of get on my email list? Uh, maybe it's contact me this time. Or maybe it's uh, I really want a hard push and a, a hard call to action. Like I want them to book a session. So again, it's just kind of thinking about that buying stage and like what you're trying to do. And this is just a way, it's not hard and fast, like if you decide on week one that you want to write about week three topic because you just got fired up about it and heard something over the weekend, fine, but it, it, it's just a way, again, so you're not sitting there having to think about what to write about, you already have the plan, you can get going. So again, it's, it seems like a lot of work, it's a lot of planning, and, but it will save you time later. It will allow you to take t your time efficiently and no longer staring at a blank screen. So, like I said, you can either, if it's better for your situation where you say, I have hours here and there where I can just start blogging or scheduling out on your calendar, Monday mornings, Friday afternoons, Wednesday nights, whatever, this four hour block I'm just gonna dedicate to writing. Using the WordPress scheduling you know, uh, to autom automatically post content. So once you got your draft, you got it down there, put it right in WordPress and schedule it. Boom, you don't have to touch it anymore. It's done, it'll do it itself. You know, use that to your advantage. Even uh, using Hootsuite and Buffer and getting into social a little bit for sharing that post, you can also automate those things that happen once you have the blog post in there and you know the link already that's gonna be used. Go right into Buffer right away, schedule those posts hashtags, all that stuff that you planned out, and have it get sent. Or you could do things like try writing a series of posts, like 10 lessons I learned. So each one is a post, so you know for 10 posts already like what you're gonna talk about. Um, it kind of takes a load off a little bit of, of coming up with those topics. So again, it's just kind of ways to save you time and use your time efficiently. And probably the hardest part is consistency. And it counts, and it's, it's very hard to do, I must say, you know, to be consistent. Because especially when that content marketing is working and clients are booking you, and then you're like, oh my god, all of a sudden I have a ton of client work. How can I get this stuff done? I, and I just want to say, you know, from that solopreneur perspective, it's okay. It happens to all of us. Um, we fall behind. It's just having that plan and knowing like, okay, I have to get back on that horse and do it again and just keep going. What I will say though, don't make excuses. I, I don't appreciate when I get newsletters or blog posts that say, I'm sorry I haven't been around for a while, I've been busy. And you're like, well, yeah, so have I, so is everybody. But just, just get back on the horse and just start blogging again. So with that, thank you for your time here. And if you have any questions for me, we do have a microphone. So if you can wait, because it'll get on the recording. That way they know what you're saying. Are there any solo entrepreneurial blogs that you'd recommend as uh, role models? Who are your blogging heroes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. See? Yeah. I would say, I, and I know, he's, I'm a super huge fan of Seth Godin because although he writes every day, but his blogs are super short. But he can get away with that because he blogs every single day. But they're very concise and to the point. They, I learn something every time and I'm entertained while reading them. And for me, that's, that's really important. So I would say him. I, I do read other things that are a little bit more of learning perspectives. Um, blog like Coffee Blogger actually is a really good blog. Um, you know, obviously they're, they're very, centered around copywriting and blogging and things like that, but they do have a lot of um, good, useful content in there. Do you have a, yeah. The 
wording range that you mentioned, two to three thousand words per month, I assume that's a minimal, meaning it's not, it doesn't mean don't go above three thousand words. Oh, no, 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 you can have ten thousand, that doesn't matter. Um, it's just kind of that rough <coughs> blueprint of like how many words should I be writing a month? Um, you know, if it's 1,500, is it going to be awful, you know, and, and won't count? No, that's not true. And like I said, Google's never going to give us a straight answer anyway. But it's just to say, uh, you know, maybe 100 words a month is not cutting it. Or uh, 500 words every three months is probably not enough just to keep your ideas fresh from a Google perspective and your audience. I mean, if you're only blogging once a year, they're probably never going to come back and try to read it again. Okay, and one more question. I'm pretty new to WordPress, and maybe I didn't understand the correctly, or I don't know this function. You mentioned that if I'm writing a few posts, I can set it up for a future posting date, meaning automatic? How do I do that? Yeah, so instead of uh, publishing right away, it'll be like uh, scheduling it for the future. So right in that area, I'm horrible at remembering things off the top of my head, but right in that, like, so if you're writing a regular blog post in the top right column where it normally says either update or yes, I want to publish this right now, you can uh, set it to say, I want to publish it in the future and then set the date and time. And then it's, then the button turns to like schedule. So you're scheduling it. Hi, Amy. I'm a little, um, I'm just starting out with a new business and I'm a little nervous about starting blogging and not having the followers yet, so there's not the audience. Do you have any suggestions on turning comments off, perhaps, at the very beginning, just to start getting some blog posts up so that you have content, so then when you start building your audience, or just start from the very beginning, dig in, and you know, hope people will share for you? I think those are two separate things sometimes, like sharing and commenting, mm -hmm. two different actions. Um, I tell clients with comments, because I get the same, should I turn comments on or should I shut them off? You know, uh, first thing I usually ask is like, are you asking for comments? Like if you're asking for comments, then leave them on, because if you go comment below and there's nothing there, then uh, what are they gonna do? Um, but I mean, if it's more of like, I don't know if I really have the readership to comment yet, you know, I would say leave it there. I mean, you never know, uh, you know, if someone's going to comment or not. And again, it kind of goes back to also, are you at, is that something you want, that interaction on your website there? Or do you have more of like a blog post with a stronger call to action? Maybe it's more of like sign up or come to my webinar or do this, do that. Then, you know, maybe you could justify and say, all right, I don't want the comments because I'd rather have people sign up for this. That's my ask. Mm -hmm. um, and then move from there. So it's kind of, I think it would kind of depend on your content. Excellent. Excellent, excellent workshop. Thank you so much. Two quick comments. One for solo entrepreneurs, uh, Michael Katz in Massachusetts, uh, I'm not sure what city here in Massachusetts, has a newsletter called Blue Penguin, uh, highly recommended. And then just a word about storytelling. We were talking a little bit about storytelling. And if you're not familiar with the work of um, uh, Goodman, uh, 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 he has a newsletter and he's based out of California and does a lot of work on training people on using storytelling. There again, it's not telling, your point is well taken, not telling your story, but a third party story, which makes a point of, that your clients might be interested in. So his name is Andy Goodman, he's based out of Los Angeles and he does webinars, so I highly recommend Excellent workshop. Thank you so much. Will the slides be available? I, I think so. I know, you know, obviously they're record the session is recorded, and I'll find out where to put the slides later. Um, or I'm, at, I'm on Twitter, the ABCQ, if you want to stream me, and I'll, I'll send them out PDF for you. But thanks. But yeah, that's, that's very, like, there are multiple people out there, and I would say, like, think about what interests you and what, what people are writing and that catches your attention that you're like, when their email comes in or that you know they have a new post going up or something, that you're excited to go back and read their stuff and be like, why was I so interested? What are they doing? That it's, you know, this whole thing, I think if, if anything, is to really be listening and, and be aware of what's going on out there to, and it just could be, you know, a quick, 
uh, using it on your iPhone to capture this kind of information and to do that. So, great. One more? Or no, we're, we're over. over. We're over! Oh, thank you guys.